Hi everyone, welcome to yet another one of our book and author fabulous Zoom events. You know, just like always, I'm going to spend the first few minutes doing all of the business. Quite a few of you I know might be familiar with our luncheons and remember us from our in-person events that feel like a lifetime ago. So yes, we are the same book and author society that used to go by Metro Detroit Book and Author Society and you probably did come to our luncheons. Now we are just Book and Author Society. You can join us from wherever. We are super excited about our name change. And we are a literacy organization that is still located in the Metro Detroit region. Uh, we were founded in 1972 and our goals used to be to host stellar luncheons and provide you access to authors. And now is just to make sure you have access to authors while we still try to support our initiatives to give grants to other organizations um, that also support literacy and your local libraries occasionally. So please continue to support us in all of these endeavors. We are super happy to be able to connect with you in any way that we can during these, I guess they're precedented times again, it has been a year and a half. Um, so if you um, enjoy our talk, if you really enjoy listening to me and me speak for the next hour, please consider buying her book, The Chosen and the Beautiful from our bookshop affiliate link. We do get um, a kickback on any of those purchases and they do help us fund grants in the future and fund any future programming. And that also helps support your local bookstores. If you don't buy from us, buy local, buy the from the people you love, the people that have been recommending you books for years. Those are the only things we really ask. And also there's a supply chain issue, so you might wanna buy now. I think that is all of my general business. So tonight we have the absolutely wonderful Nevo. Nee is the author of the acclaimed novellas When the Tiger Came Down the Mountain and The Empress of Salt and Fortune, which I just finished tonight. A Hugo, Locus, and Ignatile? I'm sure I missed it. Ignite. 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 <laughs> award finalist and the winner of the Reddit Stabby and IAFA's uh, Crawford Award. She was born in Illinois. She now lives on the shores of Lake Michigan. He is here with us tonight to chat about her debut novel, The Chosen and the Beautiful, which is about a Jordan Baker who grows up in the most rarefied circles of 1920s American society. She has money, education, a killer golf handicap, an invitation to some of the most exclusive parties of the jazz age. She is also queer, an Asian, a Vietnamese adoptee, treated as an exotic attraction by her peers while the most important doors remain closed to her. The world is full of wonders, infernal packs and dazzling illusions, lost ghosts and elemental mysteries. In all paper is fire and Jordan can burn the cut paper hearts out of a man, she just has to learn how. And if you've missed all the buzz, this is the Jordan Baker who is BFFs with Daisy Buchanan. And yes, we are talking about Gatsby parties. So please join me in welcoming Nevo. Me, I am so excited to talk with you. I have been talking up your book to literally everyone the last two weeks, and it was one of my most anticipated reads. And as soon as I found out we were having you, I was like, oh, I can't read it yet. <laughs> I've got to wait so it's fresh in my mind. So thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I hope I hope the book gave you a couple a couple good nights. I hope it was fun. <laughs> it was absolutely fantastic. Oh, great. I have fond memories of the Great Gatsby, which might not be true of everyone that went through the US educational system, <laughs> but it was such a treat to see how you worked what is really a story we all know and love now. There have been movies. It is now in the public domain. Yours is not the only major retelling that came out this year. So it's it's been in like the tops of minds. Uh, so it was so nice to see something female, something queer, something a little magical in what has always been a bit of a boys club. Um, how did you come about this story in particular? Well, I mean, so I got The Great Gatsby um, in high school, like so many of us did. It was uh, it was one of my favorite books uh, growing up. I loved it. Um, it sort of stood out to me because I nearly got run over by a car the day we started in high school. So, you know, that was, it was, very, it was, it's always been kind of linked in my mind with, you know, death and vehicular manslaughter. Um, so, you know, I've always had the idea of, of, um, you know, the various worlds that the great Gatsby touches on all the strange places the story goes and how much story Fitzgerald folds into what is 42,000 words. It's a very short novel, but there's so much in it. It's a brick of a book in reality. And um, so it came about the idea that, you know, there's always been um, stories related to The Great Gatsby in my head. And then a couple years back, um, 
I write out basically about six months after I got an agent that's being Diana Fox at Fox Literary. Um, I was, uh, she, you know, she offered to represent me on the strength of my novel, The Siren Queen, that is coming out next year. And I was working on another novel, which was about a girl raised by ghosts. And uh, yeah, it sounds cool, doesn't it? It sounds super cool. And it's still half done. And um, what happened was, uh, Diane, I was on a call with Diana and she says, so have you got anything else going on? And I'm like, oh, sure. And I basically pitched her what would become The Chosen and the Beautiful in about, you know, four sentences in about two minutes. And when I stop talking, there's this real quiet from the other end of the line. I'm like, oh, cool. I finally said something so dumb. She's going to fire me as her client, which is not a thing that agents do. She told me that's not a real thing. Well, that's comforting. It, yeah, I know. It's great. She's, it, it, they're, they're very tolerant of, of, of my people, I suppose I should say. And she says to me very seriously and very slowly to make sure I don't misunderstand. She says, me, nee, I'd like you to stop working on what you're working on now and go write that. And I said, okay. So I ran off and I wrote um, The Chosen and the Beautiful in about two, three months, I think. And um, that's about how that happened. I still have that half a novel about the girl raised by ghosts. I hope I get to go back to it. But that was basically the genesis of it. And um, uh, and that's why we have agents. <laughs> that's fantastic. So I'm guessing you didn't know that Gatsby would be in the public domain this year and that something like this could actually be published I think the worst part was I kind of knew and then I forgot and then I th then you know it was um you know because I remember the idea that was going when I read about it in high when I read it in high school I'm like oh hey that's going to be uh on the public domain when I'm 40 and then you know because I was like about 17 I was like 40 that's not a real age and yet here we are today oh no yeah it's one of those things that you think one day you'll be able to write like publish fan fiction about Lord of the Rings but that's when you're older and it will definitely come in our lifetime. Mm, no, it, it's, it's very intense. And I'm like, oh, cool. Teenage me, you're an idiot, which is always a really fun thing to, to realize again and again and again. Well, and now you can capitalize. <laughs> yes, money. <laughs> Did you have to do any extensive research? You do a really nice job kind of mimicking Fitzgerald's um, kind of impact. You, you've packed a lot into this book as well. And it is not it is not a tome it is a very easy short read i hope so I, I, that's what i want to be i want it to be so much fun um part of it was uh so i reread um the great gatsby several times to write the chosen and the beautiful and one of the readings i went through and i just basically underlined everything i did not immediately understand um for example i didn't know for sure what a hydroplane was and there were more options than i thought there would be um, I think I finally ended up on the option, which I'm pretty sure is the right one, of a plane that can land in water. It can also be a number of other types of planes or or ship or or ships. And I'm like, okay, this this could have been clearer for me. Uh, but every time I, I ran into something I didn't understand, which was more often than I ever thought would it really would be, like every song that came up, I started. I made sure I read like at least a transcript of the song or I listened to it. Um, I, one of the big one of the big reveals that came out of it for me was um, Daisy talking about being in the twilight sleep, which I discuss in the book and as a method of supposedly painless birth control that uh, women could undergo in the 1920s. Um, of course, this uh, this idea of birth of uh, giving birth. I'm sorry, um, painless uh, painless process of birth. Okay, that that doesn't that doesn't scan well. But it was the idea of being knocked out by scopolamine and waking up with a, a beautiful little baby in your hands. And the idea was, no, you still underwent the pain. Your body still undergoes it, but it, you just don't remember it or you don't remember it for a while, which is a horrifying thing to have memories of as you, as you start developing nightmares. So um, yeah, the, the more I dug into it, the more like every single, I, I looked into every single mention the bigger the story became and the more firmly placed in the 20s it became, a very specific uh, time in American consciousness and history. You did, I, I will just be singing your praises all night. Oh. Seriously, it was one of my favorite reads of the year. Um, but you did a wonderful job of that. And I think part of that, and maybe it is your extra daisy research, it feels incredibly feminine, but rooted in female power, not just fancy dresses, but in questions and in trying to navigate a society that doesn't want women to succeed or do very many things. And by also making Jordan Vietnamese, I'm sure you have many other connections to that as well, but it was so nice to see 
this story that is so firmly rooted in men and parties and trying to like steal back their youth through that lens. Was that something you were doing purposefully or did it just kind of come about as you were working? I think um, I had a vague idea of what, a, what I wanted it to be when I first started writing. And then as I learned more about the twenties and as I learned more about the people who are living in them, the story becomes what it has to become because um, every time period, it's more than a record of the people who are telling the story. It's the record of the people who get forgotten and the people who aren't allowed to write or aren't allowed to publish or who, um, and this is one thing that I learned, um, who can publish, but then their husbands own their copyright, which I was horrified to learn. I'm like, that's a thing. That's, that's a real thing. And it's terrifying. That predates the Gatsby a little bit, but it still stuck with me. Um, and one thing that helped me really put um, the Great Gatsby itself into perspective was how recently white women had gotten the vote, actually, which is part of it. Jordan's aunt, uh, Jordan's aunt in The Chosen, The Beautiful, uh, she's a suffragette. That's a very, very recent battle. Um, I was joking with um, my editor about it. Um, and the idea was, you know, Daisy's only had the vote for two years at, as of The Great Gatsby. Jordan doesn't have the vote at all. And then we started laughing, we're like, wait, Daisy doesn't vote. We know for sure Daisy is not a person who votes. Um, so that sort of gave me an idea of who Daisy was and also the world she was living in. Um, and also the world Jordan was living in, which is where these laws happen and they have no control over them, which is a terrifying place to be. Exactly. And it, it doesn't feel inherently different from watching the new cycles play out today. Oh, it's a special kind of horror, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yes. This is why I'm spending so much time with books like yours. Um, which also kind of includes some nice, I'm not sure magical realism is the correct term, but you have some nice magic in here as well. <laughs> is there- Magical vengeance maybe, a uh, power grab, something like that. Yeah, how did you come up with that type of magic? I'm not familiar with that. So if there's some huge tradition in paper magic, please educate me. <laughs> uh, not really, actually, um, actually how many, how, can we talk about spoilers? Uh, like, cause there's this one big spoiler that kind of goes into why the paper magic is a thing. So it, what's, what's her deal on that? I, okay, I personally love every spoiler for every book. I had Harry Potter spoiled for me gladly. <laughs> when I was reading it, when it first came out, when I was in my teens. Mm -hmm. So I am fine with spoilers and we will just put a huge in our recording. We're going to talk about spoilers for the next few minutes. And then I'll wave my hands uh, when we are done talking spoilers. So if you come back for the recording, I'll wave my hands. And if you really, really don't want this book spoiled for you and you're watching right now, mute me and I will wave frantically in a few minutes. <laughs> Sounds perfect. Okay, so the reason why Jordan is a paper magician actually comes from The Great Gatsby itself. On, I think like page two, Nick starts talking about um, the idea that one of his ancestors paid someone else to go to war for him in the Civil War. It's a really, it's an interesting moment where, he's, where we're talking about reality and um, honor and the effects of war. Um, and then it kind of made me leapfrog to the idea of uh, paper sons from Asian American history, where during the time period, basically about between 10 and 20 years before um, The Chosen the Beautiful takes place, they severely restricted the amount of uh, immigrants coming to the United States from China. Um, and they had to go and the immigrants who did want to come in had to pass rigorous, rigorous um, testing to enter. And they had to be related to someone who was already in the United States. Um, so there was this actually this underground trade of people who would pretend to be related and, uh, and you know, and, and selling off family information so people could make it into the country and work. And one of the most interesting things was the idea that they called these, uh, these later immigrants paper sons, the idea that they would be sons on paper. And it sort of got me thinking about the idea of legitimacy, paperwork, immigration. And once I'd had that idea in my head, the idea of making Jordan into a paper magician, um, makes so much more sense. And then, you know, and then there's the thing I do to Nick at the end where he's actually made of paper, which was so much fun to do. I don't, I can't even tell you how much fun that was to write, but okay, that, that's about the end of the spoiler, I think. So, no. but I will say that as another person that enjoyed Great Gatsby a lot, really liked it, loves the end with the boats against the tide, that ending I was shocked. I, I also did not read the full description on Goodreads or Amazon or anywhere else beforehand. So I didn't even see the 
heart thing until I was pulling it up to um, read this intro. And I was like, oh, I would have been just knocking myself in the head. <laughs> so absolutely fantastic and such a cool type of magic. It, it, and it's supposed to be different from everyone else's. And I wanted Jordan to have something that tied her, whether or not she liked it, to where she came from, besides just her physical features, besides just the reality of, of her body and her face. And so I just wanted to make it just a little bit harder for her to get away from who she was, which is which is always hilarious because she would like very much not to care. She would very, very much like to be having a much better time than she is. Yes. Oh, I should probably do some waves. Okay, we're back. We're all good. We're all good. You do a you do a very nice job in such few pages of showing that type of Jordan too, of that kind of in between of I'm okay, I am well off, I am mingling in these societies while also having her acknowledge that this society is not for me. That was very powerful. And near the end of the book, when she starts going more towards Chinatown and seeing more people that did not have the money and privilege that she was raised with, but had her feet that had her features. Um, was that always in your story? Because that clearly wasn't part of Gatsby. I think it was, um, <clears throat> I think it comes from the idea that the whole time, my whole life, Gatsby has been given to me as the great American story. And then, so I was thinking, okay, what does the great American story look like if we're looking at a, a different American, like, like Jordan is, and there's just, and that's part of it. Um, I honestly believe that the types of stories that we write, the person we are is going to come out regardless of what we try to write, it'll be there. So I'm like, okay, that's going to come whether I like it or not. So we'll just let it come and then we'll reinforce it when it does. But it also gives me the opportunity to write lines like where Jordan is, um, she's in a car and and um, her uh, friend Kai, who is part of the Vietnamese paper cutting troupe, and he's basically rescuing her from out of a, out of a trash can, essentially. And she says to him, she's like, oh, by the way, this car is stolen. So just in case you know, just so you know, and that is so much of a worse line for Kai than it is for her because Jordan, that's, you know, she can buy herself out of any kind of trouble she can get it into. Kai, who, you know, has to share a room with two people he doesn't like very much and, you know, doesn't like going to Philadelphia. It's, um, it's much worse for him. So that was a really fun line to write both, um, both for Jordan to say and also for Kai to hear, which is, it's a bad, it's, it's a bad morning for Kai. Yeah, yeah. And it has that impact. Um, so this is not your first stint with, I would call it the myth of Gatsby. You, you call it the great American novel. We've all heard that. You've also dealt with other um, historical contexts, historical settings and making them a little more fantasy. Was it very different um, for you to write something like The Chosen and the Beautiful after working on your two novellas that are set in, is it 300s um, China? Uh, no, the um, the the uh, the Sing Hill cycle. It's it's basically fantasy. It is it is absolutely Chinese fantasy. I have definitely drawn from Han Japan. I've drawn from Tang, Tang Dynasty China. I've drawn from a lot of the old martial arts movies I used to watch with my grandpa when I was a kid. So you know that's just a whole bunch of it's it's a mishmash of uh, of history that I that I just crammed in with a lot of fantasy on top. Um, writing something that is so very set in a specific time and place is very different. I haven't been to New York in a very long time, but it was it's really great that both my editor and my agent are, um, are, are in New York at the moment. So they could really yell at me when I got things wrong. So that was great. Um, the 1920s, it's one of those times that feels both very distant and very current in many cases. And um, one of the things that really stuck with me was the idea of fame and the idea of um, the accessibility of wealth and advertising. Because the 1920s is when real advertisement, advertising the way we think of it really kicked off, you know? And it was showing us this world that we could have. It was showing us not only how wonderful material goods had become, but also they were saying that we could have them, like normal people could have them, not Rockefellers, not, not you know, not Kennedys, but, but us, we could have them. And there's the idea of enchantment and the idea of seduction and illusion, which all, as we know now, all advertisement is. Um, and that just,
I had knee freeze up on my heads in our history. Oh, I'm sorry. There you are. I had you freeze up on my end. So I'm yeah. very sorry. I will use this small break to remind everyone, type in your questions in the Q&A. We will do a Q&A feature. And this is the best part of our Zoom events is that you can directly ask your favorite authors your questions. And we don't have to moderate them very much. Yep, I'm pretty laid back. You, What do you want to hear? <laughs> I love what you were saying about that advertising though. And with it not being that far away, we are a hundred years out from the 1920s and we have just swapped magazine ads for Instagram. Oh yeah. It, it's all about the life we could have and the life we should be living. And of course everyone's got it. So everyone's living a much cooler life than we are. Right. <laughs> it, I was actually for my work today, I was looking up old Fitzgerald article, um, I guess, short stories in the Saturday evening post, mm. which was completely not related to tonight's <laughs> event, but something else I was working on. And he wrote something called How to Live on $35,000 a Year. But he wrote it in, I want to say 26. I, I might be off a year or two. So hearing that today and working in libraries and stuff like that, that's not necessarily an uncommon salary still. It's unfortunate, but it's not mm -hmm. an uncommon thing that you might hear somebody making. But he is talking about it as like, how would you live on half a million dollars a year? Basically, yes, yes. And he, I, I'm not even sure he made it work. Like I've seen that man's bills, like his, his and Zelda's bills. I'm like, this isn't an intense amount of money. It was right after he married Zelda. And mm -hmm. then a few years later, he wrote a second story that was about how to live on basically no money because they no longer had any money and moved to Paris yes. to um, be poor artists. Because that's exactly where you move if you have no money, right? Paris? Apparently Paris in the 20s is like... I don't know. Colorado now. Colorado probably isn't that cheap. Nothing. I don't know where is that cheap now. No, it's actually really cool because um, Fitzgerald was making the bulk of his money off of uh, short stories, which was definitely how you made your money back then, not in novels. And that just struck me as just completely insane from how, how uh, publishing works now. It's, you know, my short stories pay for like, you know, lunch, if I'm lucky. <laughs> yes, I saw somebody on, uh, on author Twitter the other day saying like the short story prize money is the same as it was a hundred years ago, but now like you could feed yourself with a novel. <laughs> that sounds about right. Um, so you have, you've already sold your second novel. Um, it's coming out next May. I have marked it on all of my to read lists. Do you want to talk about that at all? Or do you want to stay in firmly in the twenties for a while? <laughs> uh, actually, well, it's kind of fun. It's, it's kind of moving forward. It's more or less in the same world, even if it's, it's uh, completely original. And it is set in the 1930s, and it is about a Chinese-American actress who is trying to make her star in a Hollywood that's run off of fairyland rules. It is so many things, and it is the first novel I've ever finished, actually. So, And it's the one that got me my agent. So uh, the fact that it's actually going to be a book is just fascinating to me. So I am super excited for you all to meet Luli Wei, because um, it's something along the lines of Luli Wei is a working girl. She she works very hard and she would be so impatient with Jordan. So I think that uh, I think it's gonna be fun for anyone who either is coming off of The Chosen the Beautiful or um, never read in the first place. Sounds so exciting. I am very pumped for that. <laughs> Are you reading anything right now that's inspiring you or just keeping you out of the news? <laughs> uh, right now, actually, okay. So I found this. Um, I found this book, uh, this translation of the Homeric hymns, at this uh, used bookstore uh, I was at just a little a little while ago, and um, it's really fascinating because uh, they're not by Homer. It turns out they're just a collection of oral tradition um, sacred hymns from the Hellenic era, and one of the cool ones that I just found was a hymn to Ares. And it's not actually sort of a wish for success in battle, which Ares being the god of war startles me. It's basically a prayer to defeat basically the demons inside a person and to keep them living a life of peace. And that strikes me as such an interesting address of mental illness. I'm not sure if that was the intent. I'll have to look up a few more translations to see. This is, uh, I think, the... Tr the um, Okay, this is the Thelma Sargent translation, but it was such an evocative um, rendition of what sounds, it sounds very much like um, the idea of a blessing against mental illness to me, the idea of demons inside, and um, the, the, she called it uh, fraudulent passions inside, and that strikes me so much as uh, a part of the mental disruption that it can occur, like all these voices in your head that tell you things that are not true, 
And Aries is the person you ask to protect you. And that's, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to think about that. So I'm sorry. That was just, that, that's, that's been on my so mind cool. all day. Weird. That yeah. Is, it's, it's new to me. That is very cool. And we've had all of that uptick in Greek mythology retellings and all of that too. Oh yeah. That, I got through a uh, song of Achilles a while back. That was interesting. And that was, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, don't t- turn this into a plague. <laughs> But that is much cooler than a plank. Mm. Well, let me see. I ha- I'm sorry if I disappear off to the side. I printed oh. all of my notes. Not like a great millennial wasting paper. Did you have to? So there are, of course, cocktails in this book. Um, what roaring 20s party are you going to have without cocktails? But you do some little twists with them. Uh-huh. How did you get to um, things like demon blood and extra special cocktails. Okay, here's the fun thing about me. I'm very bad at alcohol. Like, I don't mean, no, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at it. I'm bad at drinking it. I'm bad at metabolizing it. I'm bad at what tastes, what tastes good. I mean, I think the last drink I enjoyed was something that tasted exactly like a Jolly Rancher that a friend made for me, if that tells you about my level of sophistication. Demoniac basically comes from being a very geeky little teenager who went to no parties and what I thought alcohol must be. That's how magical I thought it had to be because, you know, I was, I was 16 and I didn't know much. Um, So uh, for me, Demoniac is the dream of alcohol way more than it is alcohol. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen the reader's guide, which um, once again, Diana Fox, my agent really helped me write. And the fortunate thing was she's very good at alcohol. So we were like talking about these 1920s drink recipes. We're going into old mixologists books and uh, bartenders Bibles, things like that. And I'm like, this one sounds good. And she's like, you know, that's disgusting to drink. And I'm like, no, I didn't, but I'm glad you told me, you know, before we inflicted it on a whole new generation of people. Everyone pulling it up online being like, I can clearly make this (laughs) does not mean you should. Right. Right. And, um, and I mean, a lot of the early cocktails are meant to disguise the taste of bathtub gin. And that, and I'm like, oh, that makes a lot more sense now. Yeah, we can buy our alcohol legally now. Yes. So it can taste and, a little better. Yes, and it won't make you blind. And it won't make you sick, theoretically. So there you go. We can hope. We can hope. <laughs> so you did not taste test anything that I am guessing. No. Um... No, I think I, Diana actually took one for the team and I think she, she managed to try a few of the drinks, but for me, it was just a, well, this sounds very cool. I hope I'm not letting people in for some really bad surprises. <laughs> that is fantastic. It's like the parties thing too. Sometimes people tell me, it's like, you really nail parties. I'm like, it's because I'm bad at parties and I'm not very, I, I don't think I'm very fun at them. Well, what you get out of that too, is that in the original, Nick isn't good at parties. Oh yes, he's a very he's a very sympathetic character when I'm like, I'm pretty sure you're drinking just to make this all bearable. Exactly. And you still got the like the, the bookshelf scene with the random guy in there being like, none of the books are read except they're now magical books. Mm-hmm. I think there is always that one person at a party. <laughs> always, always. And we are coming up on the QA, so please make sure you type in questions. You have course through the rest of the program we are here not all night but another half hour so you've done research for the 20s you've done research for the 30s you've created your own fantasy worlds and you are working on a story about a girl raised by ghosts are you going to do any other eras or just slowly working your way up to the 2000s so basically, I'm just sort of flailing around and seeing what my career will bear. I'm, I'm kind of new at this author thing, as, as might be guessed. Uh, the fortunate thing is that uh, I'm originally a ghostwriter. I've been a ghostwriter for about 15 years. Um, or, you know, um, basically, if people would give me money, I would generally write it, which has led to things like, you know, like um, writing cockroach care guides or how to lance the abscesses in the, in the foot of an alpaca, which is very exciting and surprisingly disgusting. Ooh. Yeah, it, it's um. They, they sent me like reference videos for that one, and it's you just have to go after the abscess with like uh with like a pick, and the the the, the pus that spews out is really an intense experience to see. I wasn't even there, and it was pretty intense for me. Oh, I was hoping this was far more like Emperor's New Groove. With oh no, no, alpaca are beautiful and 
disgusting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, it's, you know, I'm just sort of flailing around and, and picking up whichever projects uh, catch my interest. Um, I've written a lot of things and basically my, my, my litmus test is it has to be more fun than writing um, uh, ad copy for vacuum cleaner tubes. So, I mean, I'm having a great time. So wh- wherever, wherever that takes me next, I'm, I'm pretty excited to go. Um, I'm guessing as a reader that one of your goals was always to be a published author. Is that why you were doing the ghost writing and the <laughs> vacuum cleaner copy? Is that how you were making ends meet before you started selling your actual um, now published under your name work? Hmm. Um, you okay. also do not have to answer. <laughs> no, no. I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this without sounding as much like a money grubbing hack as I really am. Cause I am. Um, let's see. Uh, I knew, I knew basically from the time I was a little kid that I would be writing whether or not I was getting paid for it. You know, it's writing is fun. Writing is it's a writer is definitely a person I am and not just a thing I do, but you know, I probably could have been pretty happy just writing, you know, with my like 15 pen names on archive of our own fanfic, right? Um, I got into writing uh, as a profession because around about the age of 20 or so, I stopped being able to sleep. Uh, I had a job in tech support at the time. And, um, and so I'm like, I would like more money. And I think, and I think possibly my, uh, my, my tech support company might be a tax shelter for someone at the top. Maybe I should get out before. And so, you know, I was, I was picking up like a number of weird, odd jobs. You know, I helped move a library. I was, okay. you know, a few, a, few, a few random things. And one of them Bless was- you from all of the librarians on the book and author board. Mm. Oh, the, the library thing? Oh, it was actually at the University of Illinois. And they were moving like a whole bunch of, of uh, material into deep storage. Oh, which, uh, so, you know, it was basically both winnowing the material and also taking it to a high density uh, storage facility where they were stored by size, which is a deeply intense way for uh, people to catalog because I'm like, if we don't actually scan what's in these boxes, you will never see it again, which was deeply disturbing and terrifying for me. No, I, that will be my nightmares. Um, it is a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So with the writing, um, I picked up a couple uh, freelance gigs and kind of went from there and then slowly started paying more than the um, more than the, than the, the tech support gig, which turned out to not be a, uh, a tax shelter at all, but was just terribly mismanaged. So, I mean, so there was that, um, you know, it was and then I just sort of just started writing and started writing for more money and more money, which is it's funny that I, I it's that I bring this up because I thought I was doing pretty well. And then I talked to Diane about this. And when she heard about what rates I was taking, her response was, you are being exploited. Like, I can't hit the pitch she hit when, when I got there. And she's like, no, you're not writing for that anymore. So it was, uh, it was, that was a fun conversation for us to have. I am glad you have a Diana, but also I'm glad you were proud of what you were making. Everyone should have a Diana. They're fantastic. I highly recommend it. So Giddy, oh, Kathy is here now. I will let Kathy Kathy do her spiel. Mm -hmm. Well, I can wait. No, you're still going, but we do have, um, we have several questions. Um, so I just wanted to give you a heads up that um, people, people are anxiously, not anxiously, but definitely interested in um, having you answer their questions. Sure. So are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Um, so our first question is from Cassie and Cassie wants to know, what do you struggle with most in your writing life? Um. Let's see, what do I struggle with most in the writing life? Well, the uncertain future is not very nice. The idea that I think Europe just ran out of paper is a little terrifying. Um, writing in general, honestly, the idea that when I have, uh, when I'm on deadline, everything is more interesting than writing. Like my cat is more interesting than writing, um, drawing, knitting, staring outside at whatever fight is going on outside my window is more interesting than writing. And, and that's not true. That is my brain lying to me. So possibly my brain lying to me a lot and saying that I don't want to write when I really do, or the idea that around about, um, about I think about 40, between 45% and 70% done with a manuscript is when your brain starts telling you, hey, no one's going to buy this. It's shit. And maybe you should just, you know, maybe you should go back to tech support. You know, that, that tax shelter, that, was a, that tech shelter was a great place to work. And that's my brain lying to me. And um you just have to tell it to shut up and, and do the work anyway, if that's any help. 
So Brad wants to know, would your would your version of Jordan be considered ahead of her time? She really doesn't want to be. <laughs> um, okay, so Jordan is, uh, Jordan by design is a flapper, both in The Great Gatsby and in The Chosen and The Beautiful. The interesting thing about being a flapper was we have this sort of vision of them as being deeply sexy, uh, deeply subversive, and there's a kind of this reality where they were dressing in fashions that were deliberately unattractive at the time. Um, there are these amazing articles out there about how ugly flappers are, you know, flat chested, showing their legs, very slender, bobbed hair. And um, the, the idea that Jordan has always come from a place where there is a defiance of conventional order. But there's also the fact that because I was influenced very much by Baz Luhrmann's uh, movie, there's also the idea of um, her being attractive, sexy, very much a part of the smart set. So whether or not we can say that she's ahead of her time, I think that's up for grabs. I think she has no interest in being any kind of feminist icon, um, whether she is or not. All right. So Raya has a question and I have a similar question. So um, I'm going to I'm going to blend our questions. So my question is, how do you become a ghostwriter? And Raya <laughs> wants to know what famous person would you most want to ghostwrite for? OK, so the whole being a ghostwriter thing, um, as uh, as Diana said, I was being exploited and you should never work for as little as I was working. So let's we'll start there. Um, Basically, I just uh, found gigs through a friend of a friend who was uh, writing a lot of copy for uh, textbook manuals, I think. Um, and it was just from there, it was just sort of leapfrogging from client to client and word of mouth, uh, websites like um, uh, freelancer.com, Upwork, that type of thing. I mean, those places are kind of horrendous in a lot of ways. Um, the, mon the, the money that people will offer you to do good work is surprisingly little. The only reason I'm pretty sure I made it work was because I can write really fast. For a while, I was writing about 8,000 words a day, which, um, you know, and that's, um, and that basically kept me, kept my rent paid until while I was doing other stuff. So that was nice. Uh, and, you know, I, I, if I could ghostwrite for anyone, hmm, I don't know. My first thought says, huh, I wonder if I could ghostwrite for myself and then that just becomes mine. But, um, just don't say James Patterson. Because <laughs> I think he has whoever, everybody Whoever else. has the biggest payout, I think. Uh, let, let, let's, let's start there. Whoever is going, uh, I, I am absolutely willing to go to the highest bidder for that one. Oh, that is the Kardashian autobiography right there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it'd be really fun to actually interview the Kardashians and just figure out what the hell is going on. I would I would do that. That'd be a really fun, fun few months. That would be a really given the chosen and the beautiful, that would be the hundred year version after <laughs> this. That would be incredible. That would be, that would be a, that would be a cultural landmark, I bet. Oh yeah. That is what we're waiting on. That's what Gen Z is going to do. <laughs> no, I, I think that's that. what you're going to do. I think if there's anybody, that would be the coolest project. And I mean, talk, then talk about demonstrable range. Yes. <laughs> no, I just imagine it's like, if I was ever invited to that, all I could think was, Oh my God, there's so much food here. I'm definitely just going to stuff my face. I understand they're nice buffets. I'm a Midwesterner. The buffet is very near and dear to my heart. It is very important. We are also Midwesterners. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I have another question for you from Tammy. It's also about writing. Um, she says, you are so funny and delightful. Have you ever thought of writing for a sitcom? Um, okay. So there's this, um, there's this whole thing about writing for TV. And I think I would die in a TV's writer room. Um, I, I, I'm sure I sound friendly and approachable, but this, this only lasts for about an hour until the, the camera turns off. And then it's just me and my cat. And I'm not even sure I get along with my cat. You know, he's great. But um, I think what I have learned about writing for TV is that it takes someone who really works well with other people. And I didn't become a writer to work well with other people. I'm kind of mad you all know what my face looks like right now. It, it, it's... Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm, I have, I didn't sleep last night. I'm saying things, but no. um, I, I think that writing for TV is an incredible talent uh, is takes an incredible amount of talent and a skill set that I frankly do not have. If you were going to write for a TV show, do you have a favorite one? Like, or a show that you would maybe think like, Oh, that would be cool. Like, I wonder what I could do with that. 
Well, it's long gone and, and still very much loved, but Hannibal, I once told Diana that if Brian Fuller wanted to work for me, I would do it for free. And then she says, no, I will not be telling anyone that. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Um, I would love to write an episode for what we do in the shadows. I think that would be, uh, I think that would be hilarious. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that would be a fantastic time until I actually had to work with another human being. And then I just, like, all you hear is it's like, Security, could you please come to the writer's room? We're having a problem. And that's me. That's me. I don't think you would be the only writer doing that, though. We've all listened to the commentary on some of our favorite shows. And you're like, I'm not sure any of you like each other. <laughs> I know, right? And it's, it's, and it's like, I didn't become a writer to get along with people. No. You became a writer to sit there with your cat and kind of look at each other and think this is okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, you know, I stare out my window and I don't have to talk with anyone. And, you know, I mean, okay, so the first person who ever read my novella, The, um, the Empress of Salt and Fortune, was Rushi Chen, who is, uh, she fished it out of a slush pile. Um, the first person who ever read Chosen the Beautiful was Diana. And I think I might have sent it to her with an email that said, hey, look, this is your problem now. Um, you asked for it. It is now your problem. It is now your problem. It, it's like, I feel like my whole career has been leading up to me being able to say to people, this is your problem now. This, this sounds like a you problem. And um, I've never worked with much editing, uh, which is which, which is changing because, I mean, I think that every writer has a fantasy where we think that we turn in a book and they're like, oh my God, there's no changes. It's going right. <laughs> that never happens. I was lied to. That's not a real thing. Um, but before this, I've never really worked with editors before. So it was even, it was even more gloriously alone. And, you know, it, it, it's just me, my cat, my desk, the, the 20 or so plants I picked up during the course of the pandemic, you know. So I've got um, a question actually for me. If hmm. um, So I, I um, was reading some of the reviews of, of the book before our program tonight, just because I thought I want to see what the what the critics say, and honestly, glowing, glowing, glowing reviews across the board. I mean, NPR, Washington Post, Kirkus, to name a few. Um, the the NPR review though um, stood out to me because one of the lines was um, Nevo dips deftly in deftly into horror, and I thought that's that's an interesting phrase because did you? I mean, this book does not seem horror to me but what do you think I guess about that quote and you know would you ever consider writing in the horror genre so when I was a teenager um you guys know the splatterpunk genre which was basically making its point through grotesque amounts of violence and growth and gross out descriptions um that's kind of what I was writing a lot as a teenager and some part of me has never gotten over being the kid who's picked up a, an earthworm and is running at the other children um, so if I like horror, I mostly like it on a gross out visceral level, like, um, Cassandra Ka, who wrote, who just came out with nothing but black and teeth does it way better than I ever could. So, you know, as long as they're, as, the, as they're writing, I'm just going to be reading their stuff. Um, I would love to be great at horror. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I have those particular chops. Well, NPR thinks you dip deftly into it. So everyone has been so nice about this book. Like they, the reviews have been great. Um, I will say that one of the first—I th I feel like one of the first emails I ever got was accusing me of of calling it of was calling it a, a joyless cash grab, and I really wanted to put that on my website, but Diana wouldn't let me. <laughs> so you know, there's that. I've I tend to be really laid back about reviews because I think one of the first things I ever wrote, um, it was a, I got a one star review on it. And they said, um, this shares the title with something I thought, this isn't the book I thought it was. This shares a title with something that I thought I was buying. One star for this one. I'm like, okay, this is, this has nothing to do with me. Yeah. And that's basically how I felt about reviews ever since. They're, they're very wonderful and they're not for me. <laughs> they often say a lot about the reviewer. <laughs> so Cassie wants to know, what do you think Fitzgerald would think of your novel? Okay, so... A couple weeks ago, um, Professor Maureen Corrigan, who wrote one of the books that did influence the writing of The Chosen and the Beautiful, uh, Still We Read On, it's a fantastic book, had me on a panel with um, Blake Hazard, I believe, who is the great granddaughter of, um, of uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. And I, I was just sitting there and I just thought, huh, you know, this is virtual, but if she wants to try to slap me, I better just let her do it. 
you know, this is, it's fair. That's, that's only fair. I have no idea what Fitzgerald would think of, would, would think of it. Um, I hope he'd have a good time reading it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about, that's about what I got. <laughs> um, if, uh, if he wants to take a swing at me, I, I feel I should, I just, I would let that happen, but, but just one, cause no. Just I'd be jealous because you've already sold two novels and he struggled to get the was it four he published in his lifetime done? I don't know there was okay but there's a lot to say about about F. Scott Fitzgerald but there's this one story from Maureen Corrigan's book that I just love and so um I think this was uh at some point he was he was in Southern California somewhere and he was invited to a performance of The Great Gatsby so he got his girlfriend at the time they got really dressed up they thought it was going to be like this big occasion turns out it was a college readers theater group and if you've ever been to college readers theater I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about and and the thing was and he still went he didn't like storm off and he wasn't upset he went and he sat through it and he was he was kind and he was appreciative. He was the perfect audience. And those college kids were, were freaking thrilled. And I'm like, okay, that's a great reaction to a very, what, what must've been a very weird evening. So he's got that going for him. What's well, funny. I don't know if Fitzgerald would take a swear. I feel like he might get Hemingway to do it. Oh, please. I don't want to do not. It's like, I we're not going to make you fight time. Hemingway. I, mean, I don't want to fight Hemingway. I want to like run up behind Hemingway and maybe hit him from behind, but I don't want to have to fight him. That just feels, that feels unfair. No, you want to watch him fight other people. That's what, that is what Hemingway is good for. I feel like this is the best way to turn a, turn a bunch of English classes into something much more interesting. We just, we just bracket off the great American writers and let them fight each other. If I ever oh, were to become a teacher, that. this is all I am doing now. This is, I, I think, think this is a great way to, to, to just barrel through the American canon. I think you should come back and see us. And the Book and Author Society should have that program. And I don't yeah. know how, but like like a like an August Madness or something like that. And you got like Hawthorne versus Poe and Hemingway and Fitzgerald and like I think Kerouac goes down really fast though. Just oh, my first like... thought was that Poe is down in that first round. <laughs> I don't know. He feels kind of scrappy and he might have had rabies by the end. So I don't know. Uh, if... oh, that's true. So, I mean, if we actually send in Poe possibly when he had rabies, that has changed the whole se- the whole setting of the fight. Yeah, well, that, that changes everything. You got to pre- rabies No, does. I mean, you could even have a bracket pre-rabies Poe and rabies Poe, you know, seeing. I think we got to get some women in there, though, like Emily Dickinson and um, Edith Wharton. And I don't even know who else, but uh, I'll, I'll get the classics that going. Be, All right. That would, be, that would be so much fun. You would have to come back and help us out with that. <laughs> yes, this is now, we were bringing you back for this project. Author, American Author Fight Club, I'm in. Oh, All right. so cool. All right. It's a thing now. We're doing it. <laughs> yes. Stay tuned, yes. everybody. <laughs> All right. Well, so Julie's got a question. And the question yeah. is, um, would you want to see a movie version of this book? And if yes, who would play Jordan? I think every writer wants to see a, see a version of, of this. And, um, oh God, uh, she's the girl who played uh, Rose Tico in, um, in uh, the last set of Star, of Star Wars movies. Oh! Kelly Marie Tran? Yes, yes, that's her name. I think, I couldn't remember if she was going by Luan Tran anymore. Or oh. she was still Kelly Marie Tran, I'm not sure which. But, okay, so she has, like, she at first she has the cutest little face. And I've seen her glammed up for the red carpet. And I've seen her just doing the, the kind of, um, I've seen her in costume. And she is just fantastic. And she is exactly who I was thinking of the whole time when I was writing uh, Chosen the Beautiful. That's a great question. That's cool. That's really Absolutely cool. Absolutely perfect. Well, and then um, we've got a question from Deb, who wants to know, um, not so much favorite authors, but who, who do you read and, and who do you recommend? Do you have anything that you'd recommend to, because um, we have a great audience always. And um, the reason why people are here is because obviously we all love books, we all love authors. So we're always looking for good recommendations. Okay, for horror, <clears throat> I'm kind of in a horror, I've, I'm kind of in a horror rut right now because I just went through October. Oh, so you got to be. Uh, Cassandra Kaw. Um, whose book, Nothing But Black and Teeth, I just really, really dug that. Um, T. Kingfisher, who wrote uh, The Hollow Places and The Twisted Ones, which is just creepifyingly wonderful. Um, let's see, when it comes to romance, I dig uh, Courtney Milan and um, 
K.J. Charles. K.J. Charles has written books that are so sexy it actually makes me mad. So it's like, why did I cross over into anger for this? I shouldn't have done that. Why is it? Why am I mad now? Which uh, so that that's uh, so there's a lot of that going on. Um, you know, just a lot of feelings, I guess. Too many feelings. I'm, I'm not I'm not equipped for that. Um, so let's see. KJ, Elliot, I'm going to type these into chat so people. Oh, can. sure. Yeah. So uh, Elia KJ Bedard. Charles. Uh, yeah. KJ Charles for romance. Um, Elia de Bedard, who is just writes just amazing fantasy. She's so, so freaking good. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess we're, we're all reading Neil Gaiman. Cad Valente, who has um, Comfort Me With Apples, which I think is out tomorrow which sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, that's, um, it, it's, I'm sure like the minute I turn around, I'm going to look at my, my, my reading stack and go, oh, but, but yeah, that's, that's who I've been reading lately. I love Thank that you're you. reading through so many different genres too. <laughs> Sometimes we get authors in and they're like, we just read this. And you, oh, you can no tell they're no, it, people it's, get it's, in their genre. Right, and that's great. I, I love when someone can deep dive a genre, but seeing like, here's all of the scattered is amazing. <laughs> So oh, those are so all the questions there. So, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say those are all the questions. So I'm going to leave the two of you to um, continue your chat. Um, I'm going to pop out, but Nate, it has been an absolute pleasure. And I oh, look thank you so much for having me. Oh, I look forward to seeing you at Author Fight Club. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you had mentioned in your ghostwriting phase, you were doing 8,000 word days. Mm-hmm. Do you still do that? Or are you just like, no, that was insane? No, no, because uh, I think my hands and my soul kind of tried to give out. Can't do that anymore. <laughs> I know Nam Nano Ritmo is happening right now, National Write a Novel Month <laughs> right, for right. our viewers. And as I try to participate and as I watch all of Twitter try to participate, as soon as you <laughs> said that, my soul left my body. Yeah, you know exactly how much, much a thousand, uh, what is it, 12, what is it, 1200 words a day you need to make a... Uh... 1650 I think oh, is what it's started. Cool. My radar, it now adjusts for <clears throat> you. So I, I need far more than that. I will not <laughs> be making my goal. Yeah. But that is the most impressive thing I think any author has ever told me. <laughs> oh no, that's, 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 I mean, I'm not saying that they were amazing words. I just, I just, I'm, they were words. Words are the thing. Words are thing. Yeah, I can do it. <laughs> I am glad you no longer feel like you have to write that many words. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> well, is there anything else you would like to chat about or that I might have missed as I was fangirling over your book? No, if you let me, I'm going to start talking about whale fall and uh, tiger salamanders. It's I've been, I've also been reading a lot of um a lot of naturalists, uh natural history guides and articles, and I'm just like obsessed with the idea of whale fall. Are, are you familiar with that one? I am not. What is that? It's what happens when um, like something like a great blue whale dies, you know, enormous when they die and they sink all the way to the, to the basal or abyssal layer and their death basically changes the face of that ecology because suddenly there's food, there's calcium from their bones, there's fat, there's iron, there's blood, and they change the way that whole area of the ocean works. That has fantasy novel vibes, even though you're describing a real event. It's incredible. It, it's the idea of a single, the death of a single organism changing an environment. And I'm like, that's, there's something there. And I don't know what it is that speaks to me or is, is echoing my head, but I've just been sort of chasing that for the last day or so. That is super, super cool. Mm -hmm. And we are coming up on eight o'clock. So we might yeah. end with whale, was it whale falls? Is that whale falls, yeah. as soon as you're done? So no, it's, it's super cool. You should, you'll, you'll have a good time with it. It's really neat. All right, me, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you for joining us on this Monday after daylight savings. I hope you got to see a little bit of the sun today. <laughs> it, it is rare now and you are also in the Midwest. So I am sure <laughs> It will be gray for the next six months there too. Yep. yep. We're just settling in. <laughs> yep. Getting ready for all of it. Well, for all of you who are also getting ready for winter and all of the holidays, please go out and buy Nee's book, The Chosen and the Beautiful. It is amazing. You can pair it with The Great Gatsby and give it to all of your friends. Then you're set on your gifts. Make sure you're shopping local or use our bookshop affiliate link. It is in the chat right now. It is also on our website and it is in the newsletter and it will be in your follow-up um, email for this event. We recorded this, so if you think any of your friends 
may want to view it later or you want to show it to them after your book club reads The Chosen and the Beautiful, we are here to promote you. We are pumping you up right now. Um, if you want to come back and look at this, TCC, um, you talk about Whale Falls and all of her amazing work, please feel free to share. And as Book and Author Society, we have two more events this year, which feels crazy as we're at the end of the year, but two more events. Next, um, two weeks from today on November 22nd, Kathy, who was helping me with the Q&A today, will be interviewing Jean Meltzer for her debut um, rom-com, The Matzo Ball, which was going to be absolutely perfect going into the holiday season. It will be light, it will be holiday -y, it will be absolutely perfect. And then I will be back on, ooh, I should know this off the top of my head, but I don't, December 6th to talk with Mallory O'Meara um, about her new book, Girly Drinks, about women and alcohol through history. We're very excited for these events and we are excited to see what we can bring for you in 2022 and beyond. Thank you so much for coming to our event tonight and thank you so much, Ni. Nee. This has been absolutely wonderful. We are the Book and Author Society. We are very happy that you came to see, watch us tonight and please make sure to follow us on all of our social media so you don't miss any events and sign up for our newsletter. And thank you all for just listening to me talk for three minutes straight about all of that. Thank you again and me. Nee, this has been absolutely wonderful. It's been great. Have a great night, everyone.